Mr. Brown. Good morning, Chairman Dutton, Vice Chair Lujan, members of the committee. My name is Andrew Brown. I'm Vice President of Policy with the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Uh, in addition to that role, I also oversee our work on child and family issues. Uh, in family law, as you know, there are a few principles more important than the best interest of the child standard. Um, in our Texas Code itself, section 153.002 says that the best interest of the child shall always be the primary consideration of the court in determining issues of conservatorship and possession of and access to the child. Despite the obvious important of this, importance of this standard, Texas Code offers very little guidance to courts on how to apply it. As Judge Warney said, it's a lot of, I know it when I see it. And some of this is understandable because each one of these cases is as unique as the individual family that's involved in that case. And there's always going to be that certain amount of subjectivity that's involved in judicial decision making when you're dealing with these complex family dynamics that vary from case to case. However, in many ways, Texas is an outlier among states in the fact that we have very little guidance in code on how to apply the best interest standard. Uh, for example, more than half of all states, not including Texas, have language in their codes emphasizing the importance of family integrity and preference for avoiding the removal of the child from his or her home. Approximately 22 states, as well as the District of Columbia, have statutes that list specific factors for courts to consider when making a best interest determination. We have something similar in the sense of the Holly factors, but that's case law rather than statutory law. Interestingly, there are three states that I was able to find in the research that I did on this topic, Connecticut, Delaware, and Idaho, that actually list factors that courts may not consider when making a best interest determination. And this includes things like the birth parent's sex, their socioeconomic status, and even their uh, disability status. Um, as Judge Warney said, the relevant factors that kind of, kind of been the leading case is that 1976 case of Holly v. Adams, one thing to note about Holly is that the Supreme Court of Texas, in its opinion in that case, cautioned that these nine factors are not exhaustive and may not apply in every single case that may become come before a court. They have since taken on almost canonical status with courts, um, and you see courts being very disciplined with the Holly factors or heeding the court's caution and saying, well, we can consider these, but there's all these, this other universe of things that we feel like we can consider when making a best interest determination. Why this is important is because both the United States and Texas constitutions recognize that the relationship between a parent and child is a fundamental right that's deserving of expansive constitutional protections. The US Supreme Court has jurisprudence going back now more than a century uh, that the government may not interfere with the parent-child relationship absent a compelling state interest, even to the point where there's cases uh, that say if the fit parent is making a decision, then the court may not substitute its own judgment for that parent's judgment if it can, even if it thinks a better decision could have been made. There are obviously exceptions to that for the safety and well-being of the child, but our constitutional jurisprudence holds that courts are required to presume that parents are fit and that it, it is in the best interest of the child to be raised by their natural parents and that decisions that fit parents make for their children are presumptively in the child's best interest. And Judge Warney mentioned in race CJC, uh, which was a most recent landmark decision that touched on this best interest question. And I think the Supreme Court of Texas made it abundantly clear when it held that when applying the best interest standard, a court must apply the presumption that a fit parent, not the court, determines the best interests of the child. Um, and what, when you read CJC, essentially what they're saying, uh, from my interpretation of it, is fit, the fit parent presumption is inherently built up into a best interest determination. You can't separate those two determinations. And so any legislative action that you all take to provide clarity in the application of the best interest standard really should start from this fundamental principle. Last session, Representative Cook authored House Bill 3072 that attempted to do just this. It attempted to address that lack of guidance and provide a little bit more of a foundation from which courts can start from. 
Uh, and that's how I kind of think about addressing best interest because of the infinite number of cases that will fall under the best interest standard. You really can't have this overarching definition that's going to apply in all cases, but you can set a floor. You can set a common starting point for courts to uh, begin their assessment from. Um, and then by doing that, I think you can bring more consistency and uniformity into the application of this standard in you know, cases that are very different from each other. Over the interim, the Texas Public Policy Foundation has been working with a group of stakeholders that are concerned about this issue, and we're working towards agreement on statutory language that will finally provide some of this clarity that Texas has thus far lacked. Now, these conversations are still ongoing. Um, they're moving in very productive directions. Uh, but at minimum, uh, we at the foundation believe that any language should include or any statutory, uh, any bill passed by the legislature should include statutory language that emphasizes that when you have a suit involving a parent and a non-parent, there is this rebuttable presumption that the parent is fit and acts in the best interest of their child. Um, furthermore, that it is in the best interest of the child to be in the care, custody, and control of their natural parents. And furthermore, that this presumption should apply throughout the life cycle of that, that case unless that fit parent presumption has been previously overcome by the presentation of evidence and um, rendered in a final judgment um, regarding that child. A key aspect of the American tradition of the rule of law is that the laws be applied predictably and uniformly. Lacking statutory guidance for best interest undermines this concept. It creates unpredictability. It creates uncertainty. And by creating this foundational floor for the definition and the application of the best interest of the child, we can introduce that predictability and uniformity so that when families enter court for these most important cases that our system deals with, they will at least kind of have an understanding of what is going on and what they can expect to happen based on the unique facts of their individual cases as well as the evidence that they'll be presenting. I appreciate your consideration of this very important issue and I thank you for the opportunity to testify today.